review and thoughts of He Got Game from 1998. It's February, so we are celebrating Black History Month, and I definitely did not forget that last week and do a distinctly white people movie instead. I mean, at least it was feminist. I could have screwed up verse. I was just three weeks early for Women's History Month. But yeah, this work we're doing, we're celebrating Black History, and I intend to, if it doesn't get removed from Disney Plus before then, next week should also be a Disney Plus movie. Yes, currently it is still on Disney Plus. So, yeah. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I came very close to loving. And I will get into its issues over the course of the video. I'm not sure. There, there's going to be very few jokes in this one. And I will get into a number of serious topics. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up. It's been outdone by litter movies. Because of that, it's not as much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. But I will go into the politics. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I started this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up my index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the very ending. So, let's see that. Uh, where is the... There we go. So yes, this was rated R. And yeah, the MPAA says pervasive language, strong sexuality, some drug content, and violence. I might use strong language in this. I will not be using, you know, the N-word or anything like that. Only, you know, yeah, not nothing that I shouldn't as a white person be saying but yeah the this video will also be r-rated i will describe some of the things that describe and discuss some of the things that got it an r rating now i'm not 100 percent sure how many times i've watched this i think this is my second or third viewing and let's see. yes so the plot when Jake is released from prison, he tries to convince his son Jesus to choose a specific college because Jake is a very sought after, you know, he's an incredibly good basketball player. And this whole thing is set in, uh, what's it called? Uh, a part of New York. I'm not great with the parts of New York, but yeah. And that's, um, yes, so this was written by Spike Lee. I have to admit, I'm not super familiar with him. You know, I know the, the titles. I've heard of, you know, Malcolm X, Do the Right sh Thing, She's Gotta Have It, you know, th those... But the, oh, the, and one of the things he's listed as upcoming director is a musical, which has no title so far. But yeah, interesting. And he's also writing that one. But yeah, uh, yeah. And more recently, uh, The Five Bloods, Black, Black Klansman, I think that is just how you're supposed to, or maybe it is Black KK Klansman. Anyway, Chirac. You know, the, the, but yeah, right, and, and Summer of Sam, I've, I've heard of, but yeah, I've watched this and Inside Man, uh, let's see, right, right, the, yeah, which he directed but did not write, as far as I can tell, but yeah, you know, he is a, a fiercely political filmmaker, and that does really come across here. You know, it's it's outside of, you know, more, more recently, there, there are more black filmmakers that are getting, you know, positive attention. But for a while, it was kind of difficult to find 
movies that like were actually about black people like the the you know there's the sadly we have this ridiculous notion that straight white cis men are the default so as long as you have one of those as the lead of your movie as the focus of your movie preferably also writing and directing you're fine you know you can make the most ridiculous movie you can make it about stuff that few people care about and it's still going to be like yeah you know it's it's probably going to make money but the moment that you know it's it's about someone who isn't white you know the, yeah the and and this is also one of the movies that are about black people that isn't about slavery because obviously like slavery was monstrous it's one of the worst things that you know of of human history not every single movie about black people has to be about slavery you know after a while it's like okay like let's have some hopeful stories about black people also let's not only have it be you know but but yeah and and this one yeah you know the the it's it explores how basketball is the way you know what one of the ways out of poverty for black people and the the kind of pressures that comes with that i really appreciate the movie could easily just have been like a fairy tale but no spike lee is critical of the subject he points out how much like there's a there's there's so much like i i think uh i forget who it's something like everybody wants something from jake they you know everybody expects him to to make it big it's really just like i i'm not 100% certain how much I, I guess maybe a week or so at the start of the movie there is a week left before he chooses which college he goes to on the you know for basketball and like let's see i think what was it like there's like 10 different ones or something there's like there's a or i don't know that might have been an exaggerated so at, at one point he says there's like 10 different ones i'm not 100 certain if that's literal or of uh, an exaggeration but they're really trying you know every so often someone in the movie will come up to him and say i really think you should pick my basketball college and here's why you know and they tend to try to lure him with the promise of money of like you know prosperity it's not like this is this is a really you know some of them do actually say you know this is a place there's what one of them is like we show love for our our players but they they tend to focus on the money and you know that's like obviously it's great that there there is at least some means you know the, the the stereotype goes that if a black person has to you know is is you know uh, desperate to get out of poverty basketball or hip hop that's basically those are the the means and it's great that there are at least some means but this movie underlines there's a ton of pressure that comes with that and and you really get the sense there's not a lot of people who really want what's best for Jake like everybody wants something for themselves and and that's you know so yeah the the colleges themselves appeal by talking about money and yeah people will you know come up to him and say you know could, could you we've been friends for how long now you can spare a little bit right and yeah so i, I really appreciate that it is critical of it now let's see so yeah i have some uh did that no, right yes i have some critic quotes so like many of Spike Lee's movies, it's rambling. So I, like I mentioned, I can't really speak to that, but I, I could imagine. 
explores Black Rage, which is, again, great. Like, this is one of the movies where Denzel Washington gets to... Let's see, did I, I... I forget if I ended up copying it in. Let me real quick see. the Because someone pointed out... Um, oh, it's... Yeah, I think I know where I have it. Just to make sure I get it right. Ah, uh, hmm. Oh, maybe it's by... Okay, if this doesn't get it, then I must not have... Okay, so yeah, um, oh right, I was, I was looking through my, through the written reviews I copied in, I just realized I heard it in a podcast, but yeah, um, I believe I, I recall, okay, so the quote was that this movie and stuff like Training Day, you know, it's great that Denzel Washington got to step out of the like for so for for a lot of his roles he's basically the new Sidney Poitier Poche Poitier crap yeah something like that and it's very true like it's it's really really sad that there's this notion you know there's actually um let's see which uh, which movie was it i think I think it might have been the the siege, which you know I've I had a lot of positive things to say about, and I stand by them. But one thing, I believe it was about that movie. Certainly, it was a Denzel Washington movie. There was like apparently in the script, there was supposed to be like a love scene between Denzel and his love interest, and I believe it was Denzel himself, because the love interest was played by a white woman, he was worried that a lot of people would be angry, because interracial relationships is still very taboo in America. And, you know, that was also something like, you know, at least this is about the, the 90s, but... Actually, in the... I have it right here. In the... Um, I guess I don't want to give away exactly when, but in one of the Marvel Netflix shows, and those started in 2015, one of those shows had an interracial relationship, and... That was actually something that got the the show creator like a, a lot of hate from people and and some people like apparently there was this anti-Semitic website where she was like like they they said oh look at this Jewish woman you know trying to to get to, you know to create these interracial normalize these inter interracial relationships. Which is a really hideous anti-Semitic trope that that the Jews believe that the I feel like I have to explain it because some people don't know this, and if I just say it's an anti-Semitic trope, some people are going to be like, oh, "You wokes, you see anti-Semitism everywhere." There is this ridiculous belief that Jews, you know, it's this really racist idea that. Only white and Jews, white white people and Jews, are intelligent. If you're not either white or Jewish, you can't be intelligent. And as such, for Jews to get, you know, um, yeah, to to normalize interracial relationships, it the, these Nazis, these Nazis believe that this is a way for Jews to weaken the white race so that Jews will be the only intelligent race left. So, yeah. That's the, the kind of ridiculous... Just, yeah. And I don't think that it's good to pat those people on the head and say, don't worry, it's okay. Shh, it's okay. 
don't worry. In this movie, it's going to be racially segregated. It's okay. No white people are going to sleep with black people. I don't think that's the way to go. I think the way to go is to say, fuck you, Nazi. You don't tell me what I put in my pieces of creative expression. That's just not what's going to happen here. And I really appreciate that here. Because, because, yeah, for a long time, Denzel Washington was concerned with... He, he wanted to, you know... And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to call him out. I'm criticizing the culture. Is, is, that's, my, that's what I'm trying to do, at least. But he felt that the way for him to improve the... the um, how how people think of black people that the way was for him to play one role after another where he is just the gentlest sweetest guy and just d does nothing wrong kind of thing and i again i really empathize with what he was trying to do but the problem is you can make as many movies like yeah, Sidney Poitier did spend a lot... I, did he eventually leave that path? I, I forget if he did... And, and don't get me wrong, Sidney Poitier, incredibly talented. Like, I'm, I'm not at all... You know, I've, I've watched way more Sidney Poitier movies than, than Spike Lee movies. Um, R.I.P. Ho. He only died a little over a, a year ago. At 94. That's, yeah, he must have lived really well. But, but yeah, you know, the, the, um, let's see. Yeah, certainly for a number of the movies that Sidney Poitier was in, he was trying to soothe, you know, ba basically, yeah, soothe the frail white ego, you know, I f I'm not sure, yeah, t today we call it white fragility, you know. He was trying to assure people, black people are safe, you know, not, not, da not a danger. And despite how many roles he played like that, you still have... Like, if anything, racism, you know, yeah, racism against black people is really extreme today. You know, I I can imagine what he did. I, I don't want to make light, uh, make, I don't want to belittle his, his life's worth. But, you know, I'm sure that it did do some good. But it... Overall, what we need are for black people to play human beings in movies instead of just, you know, it, it does also end up feeling kind of forced and fake. Like, nobody is as much of a saint as the, you know. But, but yeah, you know, the, the to get back to, yes, this explores black rage. This is not afraid of coming out and saying, you know, some black people are angry, they have a right to be, and, you know, here is the, the, yeah, you know, Jesus, he's, he's angry that everybody seems to be trying to, to, you know, piggyback off his, off, off the money that they know he's going to make, the, you know, he's, he's angry with his father, because the, the, um, you know, he feels abandoned and abused. You know, first abused, later abandoned by his father. Now, let's see. Yeah, um, back to critic quotes. Some point out that, you know, the, the representation of women, you know, some, some are, are polite about it and say it's not great. Others go as far as to point out it is misogynist, and that is, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I really wish it was misogynist. I will discuss that later in this video. Now, let's see. So, so yes, 
More credit quotes. A heartfelt story about a broken father-son relationship while acted in showing the pressure and tactics used on top athletic recruits. Let's see. And, right, this person says, uh, you know, this movie is the best Spike Lee film, better than even Do the Right Thing. The cinematography gives the entire movie a true gritty and urban feel to it, which suits the subject matter perfectly. 100% agreed. Like, this really felt like... This movie feels like you are right there. Like, you are walking through these neighborhoods. Like, you are, you know... I can practically taste the food and, and you know, just... Yeah. Ray Allen isn't giving an Oscar-worthy performance here. After all, he is a professional athlete thrown into a major motion picture, but he does the job well. Given the mo giving the movie an authentic feel to it for the main character. Most inner-city high school basketball players are not going to be giving authentic, intriguing movie-type dialogue, so why go that route anyway? Spike did a good job casting this movie. Uh, wow, I copied in a lot. Um... It has to be hard for these young men as they try to balance school, sports, family, girlfriends, their future, and their reputation around their neighborhood and city. It is a lot to handle for anyone, let alone a high school kid. The movie shows this in detail, how the, his, this character is trying to balance everything, and on top of it is the man of his house. And... Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, his his mother is dead, his father is in prison. Let's see, and... What we see is a young athlete getting everything all at once. Schools offering him girls and taking him to parties. Agents offering him money and jewelry to sign with him, go to the NBA. A very authentic and real movie. This is a must-watch, not just for sports fans, but fans of good dramas as well. Well done, Spike. Now, let's see, uh, one critic says, things occur unnaturally is a very movie, in a very movie type of way, in that they occur because they have to in order for Lee to try and make a point, and for the plot to move along. That is true, that is one of the less lesser aspects of the movie. Spike Lee does a masterful job creating a beautiful looking and at times powerfully moving look at the state of today's basketball recruitment process. Also painting a lovely story between a father and son struggling to deal with hate and past sins. Lee ties in religious themes which at first seemed gimmicky but makes sense after a while since the, de the film deals with temptation, redemption, and salvation. Given the religious devotion millions of Americans exhibit for basketball and its superstar, Spike Lee's satirical use of biblical images is understandable. The heart and soul of the film, however, is its father and son reconciliation. The poetic finale of He Got Game beautifully conveys the spiritual connection that can link those who have been renewed by the liberating power of forgiveness. The movie is one of the director's most passionate films because it's about his own personal passion for the love of basketball. One of the richest and most mythic of sports. I wouldn't know. But to Lee, it's also the most holy, and with that said, it has no shortage of religious undertones, symbolism, and imagery. Let's see. While I don't consider myself much of a religious person, despite a Baptist Christian upbringing, there is a lot of religious allegory. Let's see. Um, yeah, there is a lot of religious allegory in this movie. So what you're saying is when religious people think they see religious allegory in films, a lot of the time, you know, not here, but a lot of the time, they're seeing what they want to see. Very true. You know, honestly, I, I did feel like at times the, the religious imagery, imagery borders on, like, blasphemy. So, thumbs up. If we don't sin, Jesus died for nothing. Now, let's see the... And... Um... Right. So, the... Yeah, moving on to direction. So, yeah. 
this and Inside Man are the only ones that he has written and or directed that I've seen. Overall, I do think Inside Man is better, but there is a lot to love here. Let's see. And yeah, so critic quotes. He doesn't give anyone a free ride. Everyone here is flawed. Everyone is damaged. And the movie asks, now what? Let's see. The film does have perhaps too much going on. Everyone seems to have a subplot and an angle, and it gets hard to keep it straight. But but yeah, that is, you know, so I mentioned not every movie that is centered on black people needs to be about slavery. It is good for them to, to still really focus on the struggles of African Americans because they're yeah, there there is they they do face a lot of problems that you know white people don't, for example. And yeah, you know, the the movie isn't saying that it's it's hopeless and it'll never be. It's just saying, you know, here is a guy who is incredibly talented at basketball and you know, here is what then happens. And let's see. So, yes, crafted with love for the medium of film itself, Spike Lee demonstrates great mastery of film as an art film. Art form blends the elements of color, composition, and music magnificently. Yes. In most films, musical montages are gratuitous, but Spike uses them purposefully. <clears throat> <clears throat> to evoke a specific mood and to provide additional meaning that would otherwise take hundreds of words of voiceover. Very, very true. And let's see. Yeah, so another critic says, this is a uniquely stylish film that seems more inspired by slick commercials and sports show intros. That is true, yeah. The story is about the ugly, exploitative side of college athletics, but the style is all about worshipping basketball as the great American sport. It is a dense and overly complicated family drama with aspirations of becoming a sports classic. And let's see... The richly defined acting of Denzel Washington single-handedly saves the film from becoming a preachy exercise in melodramatic narrative. Now, originally he thought his first sports film would be a biography of J Jackie Robinson, but after struggling for two years to find the financing necessary, uh, Lee put the project on hold, and in 96 his wife told him he should write an original screenplay, something in his own voice. And let's see. Yeah, the once he started writing, uh, yeah, the first writing since in in six years, the first thing that came to his mind when he started writing was basketball. He wanted to avoid sports cliche that hokum who's yours Rocky kind of sports movie. No underdogs, no team from the sticks. Knowing that every NBA player who spotted him outside Madison Square Garden would be on his case if he made a bad movie about a basketball, Lee also wanted to avoid the inaccuracies of many recent hoops flicks. Those films, everybody's dunking, and you can tell they got tra trampolines off to the side. Guys are flying through the air like it's a karate movie or something. And let's see. Um, he got uh, it's a film of highs and lows, from beautiful on-court scenes to pointlessly gratuitous scenes, like the one in which, yeah, there, there is, yeah, the the sex scenes in this are very gratuitous. Let's see. I I think an argument could be made that one of them, uh, maybe maybe two of them do have like something to say and and but at least one of them is you know purely like yes it is making a point but for one thing the point had already been made earlier and for another it just doesn't really yeah it it doesn't really add anything to the movie that yeah 
There are moments of great passion that are followed by scenes that are terribly juvenile or over sentimental. And let's see. And the use of Aaron Copland's inspirational, in quotes, music sends some scenes over the edge. Spike would have fared better to stick with Public Enemy. So the, the yeah the this movie does a really great job setting a tone from right away like some some filmmakers especially today i feel like don't appreciate how important the first impression a movie makes is like the the if you open your movie really really well people are willing to stick through if if then like you have some of the movie being lesser because they've got that in their mind. Ah, you know, the movie reached a really high level earlier. Maybe it'll go back there. You know, right now it's it's down. Maybe it'll go back up. This does a really great job. The very the, the opening of this are these slow-mo shots of youths playing basketball in what are clearly low-class locations. So it's you know, it has this kind of aspirational thing like um what's it called? Um Oh, right, right. And then we see a, you know, Michael Jordan statue. So it is very clear that the, you know, there there is this aspirational element that they are clearly hoping that the game will get them out of this low class area. They're, they're not like sitting around crying about how bad they have it. They're trying to to get out. Through, through that. And then we see the, you know, Jesus and his father Jake both playing basketball in very different places, you know. Um, ah, crap, I forget where exactly Jesus was playing, but it might have been like of um, a celebrated game, I think. In, or wait, no, was it when he was playing in. Ah, crap. Anyway, there's. Bear with me here, there's a lot of basketball in this movie. I cannot keep every single instance of basketball straight. Anyway, he's playing surrounded by, you know, people who think he's great. Jake is playing at Attica, you know. So it's, they're both talented players, but there is a strong, you know, there there's a contrast there. And at the same time, a connection there. You know, they are connected by the game. Even, you know, I mean, playing in Attica, it's not that he thinks, oh, any day now, someone's gonna, you know, an NBA agent is gonna come scout me. No, it's it's a way to to remember his son, even though he's, you know, they've been apart for many years. It's a way to, to try to, you know, focus on, well... My son is doing well, you know, he's, the, the, you know, or, or at least hoping that he, I've, I've, I'm not 100% sure how much he knows about what's happening on the outside world, but yeah, you know, there's this thing of, again, he's not sitting around crying, he's not like, you know, that's, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but that's not what this movie is really interested in. You know, so so yeah, he is thinking, and and later in the movie, he does he tells Jesus, "I wanted you to succeed at basketball." I I forget exactly what he said, but he says something like, "The way that I couldn't," or so, something like that. You know, so and um, let's see, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the first chunk of this movie does a really good job setting up really most of the major themes of the movie. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but it fits with what came, you know, there's, there's an element to the ending that is a bit more metaphorical and symbolic compared to the rest of the movie, and some people have really hated that, but... I don't, I, I think, 
mainstream audiences are way too scared of metaphor in in movies like it's even if you don't understand it i really don't think there there are things about this movie that i i think you know are not the best i really don't think the 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 very ending is a a bad thing now but but yeah fits what came before I think the ending is is pretty good, and uh, yeah, no Deus Ex Machina, no other convenient writing, and the ending titles, this is one of those movies that realizes, like, you can do something with that, like, you're, you're allowed, you don't have to put white text on black background, you know, at the end of the day, the, the end credits of this are still, like, scrolling white text, sure, but there's some actual footage there, and it, like, yeah, I did, um, it's basically, it, it's, think of it as being, being played out, kind of, not, ah, wait, yeah, because that's, like, a bad thing now, isn't it, um, a, a conclusion, a visual conclusion. It's not, it's not quite like scenes there at the end. W you know, once the end credits start rolling, the movie is essentially over. But it's like basically letting you gradually leave the movie, kind of thing. You know, there's some, there's some footage there, and yeah, just I, I really admire when someone goes into because, because you know. A lot of people, like, I'm, I'm not going to lie, if I'm not watching a comic book movie, I fairly rarely, like, sit through end credits, you know. So anyone who's willing to, you know, to, to like, put something visual there at the end credits and kind of say, well, you know, yeah, some people aren't going to, some, some people are going to leave before the, before getting a chance to see that or, or, you know, they're not going to care that it's there because the end credits are rolling, but other people are going to appreciate it. Now, that brings us to the characters. So, starting with Denzel Washington as Jake Shuttlesworth. And, uh, yeah, some, some credit quotes. He immediately goes back to the, the bad person he was before prison. It has not changed him for the better. And let's see. Um, yeah, um, Spike shares the honors with his old reliable stud hoss of an actor, Denzel Washington. What a team they have been. Spike has been known to stray too far from realistic dialogue, and in the hands of lesser actors, that can cause a problem with the audience's customary suspension of disbelief. But Denzel is a writer's dream. No matter how no matter how bad a line of dialogue may be, Denzel can come up with a way to deliver it so that it seems authentic. If a line seems stilted or artificial, Denzel finds a way to hide it in the character with irony or posturing or something else that seems genuine in the moment. The man has a gift. At the center is a disgraced man, Jake, who is in the slammer. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I want to get into that. Um, let's see. You know what? I think I am going to put that... Just gonna copy paste that into the spoiler section, but yeah, um, Denzel does really well here. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's really that's that's not really necessary for me to say, but as usual, he does really well, and yeah, like sometimes if you if you watch a lot of the movies where he's just playing completely straight laced and and pretty boring. No, well, he's not boring, but the character in any other hands would be boring. You might forget, like, he can actually do, like, it takes talent to play someone who's actually kind of unpleasant and for the audience to still, like, sympathize with, you know, because, cause, like, just the moment that we see someone behaving badly you know, immediately we, like, the, the lizard brain says, stay away from them, they're going to get you in trouble. And, you know, some movies really suffer from that kind of thing. But Denzel, like, yeah, Jake 
has made some mistakes, but you know what? He he's not perfect, and he's he is legitimately sorry about what happened, and he's he's trying to make things better. He's trying, you know, he's he's not prison didn't fix, you know, he's he still has some some very bad habits, but it also didn't like he. He doesn't blame other people for him going to prison. He He's trying to make things better rather than just, again, sitting down and crying about his problems. So, yeah, you, you really find yourself, you know, and, and it is definitely, like, Denzel, without him, this movie would not work anywhere near as well as it does Although a, a lot comes from the the talent of Spike Lee as a director, and some of the writing is great as well. To be clear, Ray Allen plays Jesus Shuttlesworth, and let's see. The acting Ray Allen, known for known for his basketball spells, skills, and not his acting, are passable if not great. In all honesty, Alan, while he isn't great, holds his own, doesn't become a detriment. Distractingly stiff. In some scenes, he probably should not have been asked to carry as much of the film's dramatic baggage. Um, Man Alive, Denzel Washington's Jake rocks the house, as does the rest of the cast. That, that is true. There's a lot of really talented. And Jade Yorker plays Jesus Shuttleworth at age 12. And... He also does well. And Mila Jovovich plays Dakota Barnes. The third story involves Dakota, a prostitute who stays with her abusive pimp in the room next to Jake in the seedy boarding house. Their relationship seems predictable and of no lasting value. It's like the college chicks who offer themselves up to Jesus, an excuse for girls on top rumpy shot in lurid lighting and fleshy close-up. In this in in the world of this movie, women are either victims, Alan's sainted mother and passive aunt, or uh, mistresses. Let's go with that. Everybody else. Sure, in a seemingly superfluous role, Mila Jovovich badly plays a hooker with a heart of gold who reforms her scandal. Uh, yeah. But every other woman just wants a piece of Alan. Uh, let's Yeah. There's a parade of white women who attempt to lure him to a college apparently populated entirely by Playboy models. This hurts the film. Let's see. But not nearly as much as its failure to do anything but plod along with scenes that fail to connect. Yeah, that's harsh, but I can't really... It's... it's there's, there's definitely some, some truth to it. Now, let's see, the, um, yeah, others, others have pointed out, you know, at this point in her career, Mila Jovovich really did not have to, like, this is after the fifth element, you know, the fifth element made it very clear, like, here is a, an actress who can do something that, like, there's a lot of people who couldn't do that. She she had to learn a fictional language, not just like a forgotten language. No, no, no. They made a language. She and and the director. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, Luc Besson created a fictional language, and she learned it so well that let, let's see what is it was something like at. Or, or both of them learned it really well, so that by you know after a while they could have entire conversations in this fictional language. You know this is not the kind of thing that you know, and and it is like part of it is she you know she was born in Ukraine. You know, and the the let's see, um, yeah, at the age of five. Mila immigrated with her parents from the Soviet Union 
Uh, hold on. First to London, UK, then to Sacramento, California, which is perhaps also why she can perfectly pull, you know, she can sound British, she can sound American. Like, I've lost contact with them, but I used to, when I was a teenager and we were watching Milojovich movies, like, some of them wouldn't believe, some of the people I hung, up, hung out with would not believe that she wasn't American. You know, now obviously, you know, her her facial features do look very Eastern European, but yeah, you know, she can completely pass with, with yeah, language and, and such. So, you know, she had proven that there was something, you know, she could, yeah. You know, even if you don't like the fifth element, and, you know, certainly there are... It's not a perfect movie. Even if you don't even like her character particularly, it is impossible to say... It, it, it's an absurd claim to make that she doesn't do a really, really solid job in that role. You know, there... Yeah, so, so you know, before that she had, you know, it, it wasn't the, the very first, like, major role, but it was a movie that really made people sit up and pay attention to her, and, yeah, you know, the, the, let's see, this, this role really doesn't give very much for her, you know, she, yeah, she later played Joan of Arc in The Messenger from 99, Eloise in The Million Dollar Hotel from 2000. Uh, let's see. Yeah, she's also quite good in No Good Deed or The House on Turk Street, depending on where you buy it. And, uh, yeah, then she did a lot of work with her, you know, husband, um... Paul W. S. Anderson, which is arguably also really a bit of a, a waste of her talent. Like she seems to be having fun doing it, you know. But but yeah, this movie really does not give her very much to do, and it's it's yeah. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why anyone approached her to cast her in this, and I don't know why she said yes. It's, Maybe she's a big fan of Spike Lee, but this definitely did not give... Uh, yeah. John Turturro plays Coach Billy Sunday, and again, that's not really... You know, John Turturro, I've, I've heard that he's bad in the Michael Bay movies. I forget if I've seen him in a Michael Bay movie. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the, the lucky ones. I am pretty good at... Uh, what's it called? Um, the the um, when I watch a Michael Bay movie, it doesn't stay in my memory for very long. I can just completely push it away and move on to something that you know doesn't feel like taking a brick to the face. I've heard that he's bad in Michael Bay movies, but I'm not sure I've ever encountered anyone who would claim that he's bad anywhere else. And yeah, he's he's good here. He's not given a lot to do. He doesn't have a huge amount of screen time, so don't go in hoping for that. But yeah, he's he's good as always. Rosario Dawson as Lala Bonilla, and yeah, it's that's also she doesn't have a huge amount to do, but she does have to. You know, sometimes she's in a really Sometimes she's really happy, sometimes she's really angry, and she, yeah, not a surprise, she does it all convincingly. But that is, like, she has several scenes with Alan, and if he, even when he doesn't do an amazing job, she's really, she, she can help lift those scenes. Which, you know, it, it would have been very unfortunate if they hadn't cast a particularly good actor there and it, it does seem like he you know Spike Lee knew that it was a big ask for you know Ray Allen to to play essentially the protagonist of this movie given that he's not he's not like an amazing talent acting wise and and the yeah so so you know he populated the rest of the cast with 
you know, tremendous talent. Now, let's see the... Yeah, uh, we have Zelda Harris as Mary Shuttlesworth, the, the younger sister of Jesus and daughter of Jake. And, you know, there's... You, you see this... You know, Jake... Like I said, not the best person in the world. Before he approaches Jesus, he approaches Mary. Because he knows that she's going to be more receptive. And at first, Jesus wants nothing to do with him and is actually angry because Jake convinces Mary to let uh, let him into the, the house. And, you know, says, no, 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 I'll leave before your brother gets home, which, you know, becomes pretty clear he had no intention of doing. You know, and, and yeah, so she's basically, you know, it's not quite like a divorce thing, but she is the, the child stuck in the middle there. Or not quite child, she's, she's in, like, middle school or high school or something, but, you know, teenager that's, you know, being, being manipulated by, yeah, the, the, the parent because the, the you know, and, and she knew, you know, she, she, she wouldn't have let Jake in if he hadn't promised that he would leave before Jesus got back. So, you know, he's, he's abusing his own daughter's trust. This is perhaps a good time to bring up, which I just realized I forgot to. Basically, Jake has been, you know, he's usually in Attica, serving off a, n a number of years. And he has been given a week to try to convince his son to sign up with, I believe it's called Big State, which, you know, some, at least one critic pointed out, that's just vague enough that I guess, okay, anybody can relate to, to, you know, a big state school, so, yeah. And the, the, yeah, it, the, the idea that, that you would be, you know, he, he has, like, he has two parole officers, he's got the, the, what's it called, um, uh, the, bra the ankle bracelet thing to make sure he doesn't, you know, but, it's still pretty ridiculous that he would be allowed to take, you know, to, to be let out even for a week. Even for that kind of thing. But, you know, that was the movie Spike Lee wanted to make. Ned Beatty has a small role as Warden Marshall Wyatt. He is the one who explains the, you know, and it's actually... The, the the two of them, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing for the warden to call you into his office, but, you know, they start talking basketball, and they both love it, and, you know, yeah, the, the, there is this sense that basketball is basically, p perhaps not, ah, what's the word, may, maybe not like, equalizing kind of thing but it is a thing of you know it's something that can make it can make friends of even people who logically should be enemies you know that as essentially if you are a convict if you are locked up the warden of your facility is basically your worst enemy you know and vice versa so, you know, basically, if the warden, you know, some, some people are going to hold the warden accountable if something, you know, if something happens. So, yeah. And, let's see. Right. Kim Director in, this is apparently like her, her debut. And I I honestly don't even know if they work together in a lot of other cause like you know she's she's great in Inside Man so that's primarily when I think of of her you know she I I think she's good in 
the second Blair Witch movie, uh, you know, but anyway, yeah, she, she's really, really solid in, in that. Oh, right, and Jennifer Esposito plays Mrs. Janice, and yeah, and a number of real-life basketball personalities do make appearances playing themselves, uh, basically to underline how talented Jesus is. Now, let's see. Right, I do want to briefly talk about, so, you know, Mike Coulter playing Luke Cage and Chadwick Boseman, R.I.P., playing T'Challa and Black Panther, you know, the, the, they're playing powerful African-American leading men who are not angry, quick to violence, but stoic, using violence only when necessary, which helps fight back against the harmful stereotype that black people are inherently more angry and quick to violence than white. Let's see, and... Yeah, you know, the, the stereotype was invented to prevent black people from getting equal rights. You know, if you think that a group of people are just unnecessarily irrationally angry all the time, you know, then, you know, you're less likely to, to empathize with them and try to help them. You know, when in reality, the things that were said of black people, that they're violent, that they're rapists, that those were things that were true of white slave owners. So just, yeah. But yeah, I really appreciate that here, you know, is a movie that doesn't feel the need to... Does this have any... I don't think this particularly has any, like, African Americans who are just stoic. This allows them to be themselves, you know. They don't have to dial down the... They're, they're allowed to express their culture and personality without the movie being scared that that'll mean that it can't... Um, what's it called? That a lot of people won't be able to, to get into the movie because uh, they don't... Yeah, anyway. So, there are there are 14 entries in the IMDb quotes section for the movie, and all of them are quite good. And, yeah. Um, I already mentioned, quoting a critic... Spike Lee is not the very best at writing dialogue. I think, yeah, yeah, a lot of it here, like, it's not, it's it's really well delivered. I don't think there's really any, even Alan does does a pretty decent job delivering the, the dialogue. And, yeah. Um, it shows some of the characters going in, in tremendously varied circumstances. We see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. And that brings us to the cinematography. Now, it was handled by Ellen Kuras and Malik Hassan Saeed. And, yeah, they do really solid work. The... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with some, some critic quotes here. The filming's beautiful, the camera work amazing, though damn, he was all about using cranes in this movie. The crane shots verge on being distracting, because damn, there are a lot of them. Like, a lot, a lot. Like, you know, ideally you want your, your camera work to be, like, motivated to be, to be communicating something. That thing should not, ideally should not be... I can do crane shots, but I would say, ultimately, I'm not sure there were any of them where it was just completely un... Um, I, would, I would argue they do all, always serve some purpose, and, and there are scenes that are not shot with crane where if they did, it would be completely ridiculous. Like, there, there are scenes where people are just having conversations and it focuses on the two people and the things that are saying. It's not busy trying to get up of, you know, above them and the, uh, yeah. Let's see. 
Spike knows basketball. He filmed in and around Brooklyn's Lincoln High, which is also the setting of Darcy Frey's superb book, The Last Shot, City Streets, Basketball Dreams, an equally panoramic but more grounded portrait of the game's meaning to the denizens of the Coney Island projects. Lee might view the, the sport as a metaphor, as both a way out and a trap for young African Americans, but he never lets the metaphor gum up the realities of the game. On the contrary, the metaphor intensifies the action on the court, which can seem kinetic to the point of spontaneous combustion, as pressure to form tears families up and turns black man against black man. If on occasion Lee's serpentine camera seems more active than the players he's shooting, he knows just when to speed the play up, when to slow it down, when to let it unfold in real time, and gets a charming performance from Alan, who in his acting demure, occupies the, his pedestal with grace and difference. The diminutive director never evinces more stature than when he's looking up in awe. Yeah, the the, the movie really does... Yeah, I, I don't know that I have that much to add. Um, I'm not a sports person. I've never really just... Yeah. But this is the kind of thing where I can watch and, like actually care about the the game you know um i have watched other basketball movies they used to show a lot on tv and i used to have relatively little to to do so you know i watched that one where it's like a math a, a kid who's good at math in high school but he's not sporty so the, you know, like, he helps the, the basketball player, the, the other basketball, I think he becomes a basketball player himself, but certainly he helps the, the, the other basketball players using, like, geometry to, to teach them strategy or something like that. Just, yeah, I, I watched a, a bunch of basketball movies made for young people. This is one of the only times where I, like, cared like I, it wasn't just that i understood that other people care and maybe even some of why no i actually get like when i watched the the basketball in being played in this i was legitimately invested and that's difficult like this movie and i'm gonna really quick find because i can't offhand recall but the let's see Lexi Alexander's movie, Green Street Hooligans. These are two movies that make me actually care while watching sports be played on, um, yeah, in a, in a movie. And that brings us to the editing, which is handled by Barry Alexander Brown. And he has 48 finished and two upcoming credits as editor. And yeah, he, he worked as far back as in 84. So, and this, and he had, yeah, before this, he had edited Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X. So they they trusted each other. They knew that they could, you know, get good... You know, they, they had a good working relationship and could, could get good stuff out of each other. And he also edited Inside Man. So yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this guy. And, oh, he directed too. As far back as... Seven, oh, he was a co-director in 79. He actually directed something in 2020, and there's there's something called Wish to Live that is listed as completed, where he that he directed, and he's in production. There's a movie called The Longevity Revolution that is in production, where he's co-director, so that's very cool. Yeah, uh, I can... Let's see... I'd be I'd be interested and more than willing to to try to watch some of his directorial. Yeah, um, hmm. based on the titles, it looks like maybe some of this is documentary. But anyway, um, yeah, he does a really solid job. Like this this movie, the editing is a is a really big part, and it can really either 
bring it to life or kill it dead and a lot of the time he really brings it to life there's these um i gotta admit when i when i f the first time it happened i was a little worried that it was gonna be like non-stop throughout the movie but there are multiple select points in this movie where it will edit the the, the editing will will take us back and forth in time and place for example, there are these parts where if, you know, where you'll see a letter, you know, being read and it'll cut between the the person that received the letter and the person who wrote the letter. And some of the time, there's actually overlapping of you hear both of them reading it, some at the same time, and it will, like, show the face of the person, some, sometimes the entire body, but several of these are, like, zoom shots up on the, the person who wrote the letter, and we don't see them sitting and writing the letter, because then you can't, then the actor can't do anything. You know, they just have to oh, writing letter, writing letter. No, they're look. If, if, did they look... They might have even looked directly at the lens, actually. Which I really respect Spike Lee for for doing all these really unusual things in a, in a movie. This this was a joy to watch. They'll they'll look at the camera, if I recall, and yeah, basically say it, and not not like make a big production out of it. They they understand that this is not really about them, you know. But but yeah, so because that's the thing, like. When you read a letter, you do think about the person who wrote it, and you think about, you know, so so it is, you know, it's not a it's not a literal thing. It's not that this person sat down and said these things out into the empty air and then sat down and wrote it. No, no, no. It's that this is the kind of thing that is, you know, the the yeah. When you're reading a letter from someone that you know. You 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 know you think of them and you imagine them you know when like if they were just if it wasn't a letter they'd be in front of you they'd be telling it this is this is a way for them to communicate something to you and several of these letters are written from the heart you know which can't be great for the the circulatory system but the the You know, removing letters from from the heart. A lot of bypass operations. Anyway, I did say there would be some jokes. Yeah, the the it's a it's a very clever way to do it uh, because it it really is like the moment that you have a character reading a letter that was written to them. Like a lot of movies will have the it's the big inspirational thing. You know, I always believed in you kind of thing. It can get really cheesy. It's difficult to do it in a way that, I don't know, I can't rule out that Spike Lee may have been going for cheesy, but to me it didn't really feel cheesy, which I suppose maybe it, that maybe it didn't completely work as much as he had hoped that it would. But anyway, yeah, I, I really appreciated that he did something interesting and different here. And just... Yeah, you know, you see the person reading the letter and what it does to them, and you see the person who wrote the letter speaking the letter as a just putting putting in the viewer's head what is in the character's head at the time. Too too many filmmakers are scared of doing this kind of thing because they're like, oh, I mean, it didn't literally happen, and some people apparently think that movies should only show things that literally happened, which is just such a limiting perspective. I, I'm i very much opposed to that idea. But yeah, I, I really appreciated that. And the, to, yeah, I mentioned the, the musical montages earlier. They do a really great job on those. Just, yeah, fa fantastic editing here. And yeah. Uh, this was made off a $25 million budget, and the box office was $22.4 million. So this was uh, a loss. And, yeah, you know, that that's the kind of thing that you... That, that, that can sometimes happen if the... the 
ah, what's the word? Um, if you are making a movie that is expensive and a lot of people are not gonna like if you if you watch this because you're religious and you heard that the protagonist is named Jesus a lot of a lot of those people are not going to like this movie they're not going to like what how it treats religion how it treats christianity if you love basketball and just want to see someone play basketball and be adulated for that you're you're uh, no you're probably not going to connect as much with the scenes that are critical of the draft process you know like you might still care about oh you know yeah um J J jesus is the, the player i care about so i don't like it when he's sad i like it when he's happy kind of thing but you're you know you're you're it's maybe going to make you feel a little dirty for enjoying the game watching you know these these really dirty tactics being played so yeah there there are things that yeah you know Spike Lee made the movie he wanted to make, and yeah, I I think he did a really solid job. But I can imagine that it didn't, and you know, it it didn't like destroy his career or anything. You know, he's he like I mentioned earlier, he is directing something right now, writing and directing a musical right now, and this movie is what twenty five years old now. You know, so yeah, he's he's fine. It didn't, you know, I, yeah, he was probably, by this point of his career, he he could survive making a, a movie that lost money. I, I can imagine, but yeah. So yeah, this was filmed, uh, yeah, Cabrini Green, Elon College in North Carolina, which is, yeah, he, he visits, I forget if they call it Elon College, but they, he, they do mention him visiting North Carolina for... A college, uh, yeah, Coney Island, and let's see, yeah, for the f prison scenes, they did film in East Jersey State Prison, and yeah, you know, yeah, it is a prison, but it is technically New Jersey, and. Let's see. Oh, yeah. L.A. There's some stuff there. And um, Chicago. Bless your heart. Some, someone, someone entered USA and, and nothing else. Just some of this was filmed in the United States, which I'm, I'm sure is interesting to someone. There's probably a person out there who thought that was worth adding without adding any more details. But but anyway, yeah. Um, and it, it gets a lot out of the location shooting because it really, the movie has a personality. Uh, you know, like I've, I've spent almost no, I, I spent like half an hour in New York once. You know, and that was, what, 15 years ago or something like that. So, you know, but... Yeah, movies like this, it feels like you've been there. You know, this is the kind of movie where you're gonna, like, you're gonna watch it, and that night you might have, like, a dream about being in New York, and it's gonna be super detailed because you watched the movie. You know, so, so yeah. Um, that's another thing. Like, t t some movies today do not appreciate what you get out of location shooting, and, yeah, it really just, yeah. I, I, um, they did a really great job on it, is what I'm saying. Now, right, that brings us to the score. And the score was handled by, uh, huh, does it really not say... Uh, let's see, what if I just say composer? Yeah, there's a there's a music department, but it doesn't say exactly who did the... Yeah. But I do have a few critic quotes. Instead of relying on a rap soundtrack, he uses 
rap Three Cheers for Public Enemy to punctuate scenes and moments, or as background music, relying on a classical score to really bring the beauty out of the game of basketball. Very true, and and yeah, like I, I love rap music, so if this movie had been wall-to-wall -wall rap, I would have absolutely loved that. But I do agree that this more sparing use is really excellent, because each time a rap song started up in this, I was like, yeah, damn straight, that's, yeah. And another critic quote, Lee has chosen to use Aaron Copeland's music to provide a symphonic score that is curiously at odds with the lives we're watching. The visuals get down on their knees and sob for hip-hop, yet the score is appropriate because it helps to uni universalize a story that otherwise might seem locked into too narrow a cultural setting. Maybe, yeah. It, it is It is one of the only places where it does, like, try to universalize. You know, there's that, and then there's the college being called Big State. Uh, you know, other than that, like, the the slang, the the people, the food, you know, the, the um, yeah, the, the places where people live, everything is very much, like, specific to this, you know, this very specific experience, life experience. Now, let's see, the, so yeah, the pacing of this movie does have issues, like, there are parts that, that are, like, moving quite fast, and where, like, you know, I I don't know that I would say that the Dakota subplot adds very much, but certainly I wouldn't say that they waste any of that screen time. You know, she's not in a, a huge amount of this movie. Each time she shows up, it means something. There's, you know, she's never just there without it, you know, doing something with her, her subplot. You know, not much, but something. But but yeah, the the at times this moves fast, at times it slows down. It's not completely smooth. Like it's not I there there are movies that are considered slow that I love. You know, I I love movies from you know, yeah, um I've I've done some research. I'm going to be doing a video on The Postman Always Rings Twice, which uh, real quick, I will get you the exact year. So, that movie was released in 1946. I love that movie. And there are, you know, movies that are much more recent, that move much faster. You know, I quite enjoy the Crank movies. You know, especially the second one. That movie never slows down, basically. You know, the well, maybe the... It doesn't mean to slow down. Let's go with that. So I'm not... I'm not married to either of those, you know. But this movie definitely needed... I would say... It's probably at least five or ten minutes too long. And... Yeah, like some of the, some of the subplots... Maybe it has at least one scene too many that is purely about the pressure being put on... J, uh, J, Jesus, you know, for sure, important to the movie, but the movie's, you know, two hours and, like, 11 minutes, you know, if you count the end credits, and, like, if you don't count them, I don't think it's more than four or five minutes or something, the movie doesn't completely justify that. There, there's, there's so many scenes of people trying to convince Jesus that this particular college is the one he should choose. And they're basically all saying the same thing. You know, they're, they're all saying, if you go to ours, you will, you know, yeah, you're going you're gonna to make a lot of money. You're going to be a big deal. And they, they go into specific things that the money would buy. You know, they, one, one of them shows his house and says, look at my swimming pool. Look at my inside basketball court. You know, all, all these things. Look, check out my expensive watch. Check out my expensive car. Zzz, 
plural, you know, and it's on their own. Like, I, I'm not saying that any one of these scenes are outright boring or anything, but there did not need to be as many as there are because they're not saying different things. You know, that's uh, like I, you know, yeah, one of the critics I quoted said that the, you know, the movie is rambling and that is unfortunately the, the you know, it feels less, at, at times it feels less like a movie and more like you're talking to someone who's super knowledgeable and passionate about a certain topic and like you realize you're kind of starting to repeat yourself. I mean, you yes, the details are different in this story compared to this story, but you're not really saying anything new. Like, you, you, you don't need to give every single detail, you know, or, or like you're reading a Wikipedia article or something, and that's not fantastic. You know, it's it's not... Yeah, you know, it. I think that Spike Lee means for it to be more... You know, the, yeah, because basically, because the way it's edit, shot and edited, I think he means for it to be more gripping than it ends up being. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, ultimately, considering how much money they clearly spent on these scenes, I don't really blame the editor because he would, they would be hell to pay if they were like, do you know how many millions? We spend on this, you know, just, okay, maybe not millions for a single sequence, but do you know how much money we spend on this one sequence? And you're saying you want to cut it, just remove it from the movie, you know. It is a writing issue, because obviously, yeah, like, when they go to this guy's place, you know, I'm sure they didn't actually buy this place, but they paid to film there, you know. they, It's someone's really expensive place, and they they had to pay a lot of money to be allowed to film there to film his cars you know the these kinds of things so yeah it is a writing issue not an editing issue now ah right so i have this on dvd i did not write down yeah i think probably if you give it at least half an hour you know, you should have a pretty decent idea of the, the, um, ah, what's the word? Of what the movie is going to be about and what it's like and whether or not you want to continue watching. And, and it's not, you know, it's not one of those movies where I can say, oh, just, you know, only watch until this part and then make up your own ending and don't... Th no, you basically do. If, once once you're really into it, you'll want to watch the whole way through, you know. It's not a spoiler to say the decision is not made until the end of the movie. Which college is he going to go to, you know? It would be pretty silly if the movie continued for very long after that. So, obviously, it doesn't do that. So, this is the part where I talk about... So, yes, the, the best element of the, the film. Yeah, uh, it's a tie. It's, uh, it's an even... Yeah, so, an empathetic perspective of a black man who has been in prison. The, the, this exploration of the relationship between pushy black fathers who end up not being there you know, being around for the entire life of their child. And the, you know, once the, the child comes of age and, you know, there's a, there's a line, there's an ex exchange between the two where Denzel says, I'm the one who put the basketball in your crib. And he responds, I, I'm not a baby anymore. You know, so yeah, the, it's, it's a movie that understands that young black men may be angry and they may have a strained relationship with their father who may even have been in prison. That doesn't mean that they're like dangerous or bad people, which, again, feels wild to say, but unfortunately some people still can't empathize with black people. And the the acting, especially of Denzel, but honestly of the the cast, you know Ray Allen, not the best, but he does do 
a reasonable job and you know everybody else does amazing now the worst aspect is the misogyny which you know i i would love for it to be just commenting on misogyny you, you know the the fact that like when you know at least one of the people who want who really wants jesus to go to you know his particular college you know basically throws you know young white women at him you know i wish that he was just commenting on the misogyny inherent in these kinds of tactics where yeah you know they're just you know to them these women are not people they are prizes you know look at all we're gonna give you if if you go here but unfortunately the movie itself shares that misogyny uh, you know it was not necessary to show the the you know the amount of of more or less naked young women in this it was just not necessary like you you can you know the the what the movie is trying to get across uh, right and i uh, yeah i am sex positive i'm not uh, you know i'm not approved i'm not saying that there's something wrong with sex whether it's in real life or whether it's in movies the way i see it ideally you'll want to communicate something with sex scenes and you know i just got done watching the marvel netflix shows several of them you know i'd, I'd like to especially highlight jessica jones when that show features sex it is saying something with it you know it has characters that have casual sex it has characters who will only have sex with someone that they've known for a long time and as such it is telling us okay these people really trust each other kind of thing you know and and sometimes you know there's at least one sex scene in that in in the three seasons of jessica jones where the woman is basically you know she's she's taking charge during sex and you get the sense that this is something she feels a need for emotionally. She she needs to take control of something. And this is something that's safe and and you know so so yeah, there there, there are things you can do with sex scenes in fiction. But this movie I'll I'll grant that at least one of them is at, at least one of them has something to say. But other times, like, there's, you know, the, the there's, a, yeah, a lot of the time, it's basically just there. Like, I'll grant, it's maybe, you know, oh, this is something that one of these people is thinking about. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not opposed to showing something that's going on in someone's head to tell us that it's going that that's what they're thinking but it wasn't necessary to have like there are times where you can't even see the face of the woman like it's just her chest and it's just that's not yeah it, it's you know it doesn't do any good for for women f to to reduce female bodies to the sex parts you know that's that's really not uh, good for um, so so yeah now uh, yeah so one thing i saw other critics say is, you know the milijovic subplot is pointless and it is basically true like there's uh, it's not that there's absolutely nothing going on but in a movie that is too long and rambly and at times kind of unfocused that is that is an issue now uh let's see oh, right and yes the the misogyny i think is a big problem for the movie yes and yes especially because it's completely unnecessary like you could easily have had more of the female characters be depicted in a positive light and really only shown the like, I get that it's part of this world, 
but you could have made like the problem is that the movie itself treats the the women and their bodies the same as it treats the guy's rolex the guy's pool you know it doesn't ask us to empathize with them it's there's no you know again and and it's not that it's that it doesn't understand that that's a possibility at all because it does have empathy for dakota you know so i i just i wish it wasn't necessary for dakota to be a sex worker you know and it wasn't necessary to have all these you know women throwing themselves at jesus in order to you know in order to sway him his decision uh, right, I, uh, evidently I did, did I not, did I just not copy it in, or did I just put it in, let's see, um, hmm, yeah, the, the, um, let's see, um, You know, basically, the 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 movie, it feels like it's two movies. It feels like Spike Lee really wanted to make a movie about a young man who's about to, you know, he has to pick a college, and they're all throwing themselves at him because they all want him to, you know, they all want him to choose their particular college. And then on the other hand, he wanted to make a movie where Denzel Washington is a man trying to reconnect with his son where he has, you know, one week where he's not in, in jail, which is also, you know, you'll note that he doesn't say that he doesn't tell him immediately when he, you know, he, he tells him, he, he does eventually tell him if you choose big state I might get time off, you know, but he knows not to lead with that because, you know, when when he finally does, Jesus says, I knew it. You're just another, you're yet another person who wants something from me in, in, in return for this, you know. And ultimately, yeah, the, these two movies don't completely coalesce into a harmonious whole and it's too bad because they are both interesting but yeah um because because yeah there's there's some super interesting stuff about jake you know now he's temporarily out of prison and he's you know like he can't like i'm, I'm guessing it's a money thing he he you know, he doesn't want to spend too much money on, on food, so he has, like, a clothes iron and, like, I, ah, crap, I have no idea what they're called in English, because I've never had to ask for them in English. I'm Danish, so, but, but, yeah, like, uh, wrap, not, not wrapping paper for, like, packages, but, like, if you're wrapping up a sandwich kind of thing, you know, and he, yeah, one... One so you know one sheet of wrapping paper, a sandwich, and then another sheet, and then the clothes iron on top. You know it's that's not something you necessarily think about. I'll try to cross it out so I don't repeat myself later. Um, I guess. Okay, I am not. Oh, there we go. You know that's not necessarily something you think of but yeah you know if you if you're just out of jail you know you don't have a lot of money you gotta eat so you might do that kind of thing you know there's a there's a part where he's like he's allowed to to live in this you know for, for the for the week he he's living in you know it's a it's a bad neighborhood but he does have his own room and like, there's just this part where he's, like, opening and closing the door, and he laughs. You know, that amazing, charming Denzel Washington chuckle. And, yeah, it's like, it's been years. 
since he was allowed to open and close the door when he wanted to where he lives, you know. So so just that little bit, and, and there's this part, you know, r right after he looks out a window and it's like just just being able to to do that is also just such a relief so so clearly there's there's good stuff here but at the end of the day it does not completely coalesce and yeah it 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 probably would have been better if lee had been able to split this into two just at, at the writing stage not not you know once he started making it but yeah you know make one movie that's about jesus and make one movie that's about Jake. And, I mean, it doesn't even have... You, you could... Hypothetically, you could make... You could make it two movies that are in continuity, you know? You could make, like, a movie where... Jake, you know, is trying to influence his son. But don't make it the same movie where a big chunk of it is made up of... You know, college is trying to convince him... You know, make that another movie, and then that movie can maybe also feature... Okay, maybe if it's Denzel Washington, he probably should have a lot of screen time. But, but yeah. And it would be a shame to not have him playing Jake, because he really does an excellent job. Like, this is, on paper, this is a... This is not the kind of person that you really want to be around. You know, he, he has made mistakes that really put people off. But, yeah, like, just Denzel, he has this charisma, you know? Anyway, so, uh, the thing I was most worried about was, you know, struggling to connect to someone whose main focus is a sport. Because that's just not my world at all. And the movie exceeded my expectations. He is such a full person that, uh, yeah, I could easily, you know, I, I could see myself in him. And the thing I was most looking forward to was more Spike Lee. And let's see. So, yeah, the, the trailer does give at least a little bit too much away, but also gives you a good idea of what the movie is like. You know, it's, it's one of those trailers where it's basically like a PG-13 version of... P yeah, PG-13 shortened version of the movie itself, you know, so if you watch the trailer, just, you know, be ready. The movie is much more, like, direct with the, you know, yeah, in the, in the trailer, it tells you the concept and some of the tone, but the movie is much more direct and hard R than, uh, yeah. The, so let's see, cover and poster... Um, oh, right, yeah, I'm, I'm meant to, uh, yeah, it won't take long to really quickly look at the, yeah, so there, there are three posters, yeah, yeah, it's the same one, um, yeah, the, the poster does not give too much away and does give you an idea of some aspects of the movie. The movie does not have a lot of metaphors, uh, you know, by and large, it is very, it's it's easy to understand. Now the yeah so Rotten Tomatoes it this has an eighty percent on the tomato meter based on sixty four reviews fifty one of them fresh, an eighty three percent audience score based on more than twenty five thousand ratings, and uh, yeah so the average rating was four point one out. Of, out of five and the average critic rating was 6.80 out of 10. The consensus reads, though not without its flaws, he got game finds speculating near the top of his game combining trenchant commentary with his signature visuals and a strong performance from Denzel Washington. Very true. On Metacritic it has a 64 out of 100 and yeah based on 39 oh hold on based on 21 critic reviews. And 13 are positive, seven are mixed, only one is negative. And 8.4 out of 10 uh, user rating, based on 39 ratings, 34 positive, three mixed, and two negative. And let's see, yeah, it's not really, 
see. Yeah, only you know of the of the five reviews, four of them are from people who rated it positive. The there's one from a mixed, and he says that the movie is too long. Character mo motivations are deeply unclear. Yeah, and this this is the guy who said things occur unnaturally is very movie in a very movie type of way. And oh, this guy also says it's cheesy, which I wouldn't quite say, but. Yeah, I don't know. I I've watched mo most of the sports movies I've watched were considerably cheesier than this, but yeah. On IMDb, there are 143 user reviews, 123 without spoilers. Uh, I read all of them. Normally, I read the top voted 100, but when there's that few, yeah, um, four people voted it one out of ten uh, of the. Let's see, was this? Ah, crap. I th yeah, I think of the of the top voted 100. Four of them gave it 1 out of 10. One gave it 2. Th 4 gave it 3. 5 gave it 4. 7 gave it 5. 6 gave it 10. But 14 gave it 7. 22 gave it 8. 9 gave it 9. And 15 gave it 10. So, yeah. Uh, the, the people who like... Yeah, the, the people who wrote user reviews that were positive were... Of, of the movie were more popular with the people who read the reviews and it only has a 6.9 out of 10 on imdb uh i would definitely say that yeah i ultimately no that's probably that's that makes a lot of sense and this is based on 49,083 user votes and 33.5 gave it 7, 20.3 gave it 8, 18.3 gave it 6, 7.9 gave it 10, 7.7 .7 gave it 9, 6.4 gave it 5, 2.4 gave it 4, 1.9 gave it 1, 1 1.0 gave it 3, and 0 0.7 gave it 2. So that's, that is still a larger percentage that I would have thought, but yeah. But, but yeah, it is, you know, the majority of people thought that it was at least slightly above average. Like, 5 is basically average. 5 out of 10 is average. 7 out of 10 is slightly above average. And it does not, there's not a lot of difference when you look at the, the demographics. Um... No, there's there's not really anything there. And then we have the awards. It did not win any. It was nominated for 10. Um, Acapulco Black Film Festival. It was nominated for Best Film. Let's see. Best, best Film, Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Actor for Denzel, Best Soundtrack, and Image Awards, NWACP. It was nominated for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Motion Picture, again for Denzel. Outstanding Youth Actor-Actress for Zelda Harris, who plays Mary. Outstanding Motion Picture in the MTV Movie and TV Awards. It was nominated for Best Breakthrough Male Performance for Ray Allen. And The Stinkers Bad Movie Awards. It was nominated for Worst Sense of Direction, Stop Them Before They Direct Again. Yeah, well, so he's their own. Now, uh, right, so it is not a very special effects heavy movie. Um, I don't, is there anything to come? There's, there's a little bit, and that is handled well. There's some, offhand, the only thing I can really think of is there's this, there's this short montage that shows, like, people, you know, suffering because of drugs, which... Obviously, they did not actually have people do drugs on camera. That just so yeah, um, and and it's convincing, you know. That's also this is one of those movies where when drugs are brought up, the people actually know what drugs do. It's not it's not a war on drugs movie. It's a it's a movie that has a realistic idea of what drugs do. Uh I I'm not sure there's any. Don't work either. 
It, yeah, a, a little bit. There's there's some scenes of, of physical abuse. And yeah, the stunts are, are done well. And yeah, the, the violence, I would say, tells, you know, some of it is misogynistic. It did not need to go on for so long and it did not need to be as harsh against women as it is. But by and large, the the violence is, in this does tell a story. Like it informs. Like you you may want to pay close attention to who uses violence when, and like you know, yeah. As an example, Jake on multiple occasions, you know, he has a temper. He 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 doesn't like that about himself he wishes that were different and he you'll sometimes see him very frustrated afterwards like fuck i didn't mean to relapse kind of thing you know so yeah the violence tends to be in service of the story it's not just you know like you could understand why someone would just be like this is someone i really hate in real life so i'm going to put him in a movie and have him be punched in the face or something you know now there will be two links in the description box to reviews that i recommend reading and yeah so the yeah i rate this seven young basketball players being lured astray by college representatives out of 10. And I would definitely say the, the movie holds up, other than the, the misogyny, which is... I mean, there's still some... There's still a number of misogynistic, you know, movies today, but there was certainly an issue... You know, this was before there were enough... There, there still wasn't enough empathy for women in a lot of, of media. Um, I do think that, yeah, overall, it probably, the, the critical reception seems pretty, like, it, it, um, it makes pretty decent sense uh, overall. And that brings us into the spoiler section. So, starting with notes taken while watching so this is your final warning from here on out throughout the rest of the video there be spoilers so let's see yeah i really appreciate like right away the there are some cuts in in time you know you have the like it's essentially handled like a heist when the um, when he's, when, when Jake is, you know, um, when they, when they sneak him out, you know, the, you know, we have the, the warden explain, we're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to suffer some food poisoning. Then it cuts to him eating, then it cuts to him in the cell screaming for help, that kind of thing, you know, and then back to the warden explaining. So, yeah, you know, it's really not necessary to have the entire conversation play out, then cut to him eating, then cut to him being, you know, because it's not, we're not really supposed to worry, oh, is it going to work? No, 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 it, it works. This is, a, this is the core setup of the, of the movie, is that it worked. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, you know. And we see that the, you know, the, the um, ah, what are they called? Parole officers are very abusive you know, like, essentially the, the one nice thing they do is the, you know, they give him that thing. I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm guessing it's some kind of yogurt for his stomach, you know, and, like, I don't know, I get, you know, okay, so the, I guess the fact that they say, if you have to throw up, let us know, we'll pull over. I guess that's nicer than forcing him to, to vomit and then lick it up, but they might also just be, like, we don't want anyone else to have to spend forever cleaning this up. A lot of people don't like Jake when they first, like, when they hear that he's back out of, of jail, you know, which is 
sadly very very realistic you know there's a you know the the african american community especially the you know the the chunk of it that live in you know poor neighborhoods yeah there's a there's a fear of being being put in prison and then you know once you leave prison you know, maybe you'll be forced back into prison. So, yeah. The, the you know, they are, they're worried about the, the kind of, you know, they don't want to be around someone who's been in prison kind of thing. And... Let's see. Yeah, even, even Lala says, you know, please do something illegal for me. I do appreciate that later she does get to be a more full character, but early on, not great. And, you know, misogynist. This idea that she's trying to take advantage of him. She sleeps with one of the agents. To, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, uh, a lot of the characters that you meet when, you know, they're introduced... As, as good people who've done something bad, or are doing something bad, but not just as bad people. And I really appreciate the, the you know, Mary's expression of, of frustration that everybody tells her she's not old enough. And, you know, she says, I, I, you know, I can't wait to turn 18 so people can stop telling me that I'm not old enough. Seriously, like that is, yeah, I I really hate it before I turned 18 and everyone with any kind of authority would always tell me you're not old enough to make that decision. Some of them seemed legitimately offended that I clearly understood my needs better than they did. So that was, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and, you know, so it's the, the reunion between Jake and Jesus does not go particularly well at first. And, you know, the, the uncle and aunt are the, the what's it called, the, um, the, the legal guardians, which another detail that I appreciate that, you know, because that's another thing that, like, you know, some, some people seem to think that if the father isn't around, which is, you know, frequently over-incarceration, then, you know, oh, I guess no one's taking care of the... No, no, of course there's going to be some, you know, they're, they're going to try to get them some legal guardian or put them in a foster home or something. You know, they're not literally just alone in, in the... I'm sure some are, but just... Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I, I quite like that there's a lot of pop culture references. You know, the, today we have that in a lot of movies. But, like, okay, yeah, actually, the 90s were a, a time where that was starting. You know, I'm, I'm re-watching the Scream movies. So it would be pretty ridiculous for me to claim that, you know, so that's fresh in my mind. Yeah, the, the 90s, there were a lot of, of pop culture references. Because, you know, we're getting a new Scream, and I cannot wait. Now, yeah, I like the, the bit where, you know, Jake, he, you know, he doesn't have a huge amount of money, but he's got to try those Air Jordans. And, you know, the guy sees the, the ah, what's it called? The ankle, um, yeah, bracelet thing. And, you know, he says, he says, oh, yeah, uh, arthritis. Oh, yeah, I know someone with arthritis. A lot of people have it. It's, it's contagious. And I appreciate, you know, Jake tries to parent Jesus and the, the nephew also. And I like the discussion about... God, you know, Jesus pointing out, I bet the losing team doesn't praise God. They're probably cursing his name, you know. And, yeah, you know, the, the movie acknowledges that 
God can, like some some people go to prison and they find God. And let's see. Right, and and Jesus is mad at Mary for repeating the claims that others make about the ah, uh, what's it called? The um. Wait, crap. Is Mary, is that, now that I think about it, um, uh, hold on. No, that's gotta be the, the, cause it says that there's one actor for just the role and then there's another role for age six. So it can't be the wife. The wife is named Martha, isn't she? I just, did anybody call her Mary? I feel like everybody called her Boo or something, but no, that's got to be her. Anyway, um, so yeah, angry with Mary for repeating the, the claims that others made. And let's see. Yeah, I, I like the, you know, Jake relates to Dakota. He doesn't treat her like... Uh, a sex worker, uh, you know, basically, I, I feel like the only time he kind of does is when, you know, when he goes up to her, you know, he does approach her as if he's John, and he says, I'll pay you, you know, don't worry, you know, you know, but other than that, he treats her like a person, you know, she shares her life story, he shares his, and the... Yeah, just, you know, and, and he actually, he shows a lot of trust in her, telling her, you know, I went to prison for killing my wife, you know, and, and at first she, she doesn't even believe him. Now, let's see, and... Yeah, the... the yeah, I, I really loved when she says... Why do men all think that dick solves everything? Which, yeah, seriously. It's it's such a ridiculous... That really is something that needs to be... Like, we have a very toxic culture when it comes to that as just... Yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, we have the, the montage of you know, the, the drugs and the sex and, you know, this, um, I guess agent or something saying, you know, if you, if you do that, then, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna end badly. And we get the montage of people asking Jesus for money, which is also quite well edited, really great montages in this movie. And... Yeah, the one coach who says, here's, here's, t uh, or, yeah, his own coach, who says, here's 10 grand, you know, the, yeah, lot of lure, trying to lure him to, and at the, the carnival rides, Jesus and Lolo, L Lala, yeah, Lolo, that's, yeah, I'm watching Star Wars The Clone Wars, there's a character there named Lolo, Lala and and Jesus are, you know, first they're making out and later they're even having sex on these carnival rides. And I I don't know, I just I feel like maybe it's supposed to Okay, I guess yeah, because we're seeing that and we're also seeing her with the the agent and later she calls him out for having sex with you know the white women at the at the college so i guess it's to make sure that we know for a fact that they have a sexual relationship with each other also rather than you know yeah maybe but it still feels yeah, I'll, I'll maybe give him that one. Um, and and Jake not lasting long with Dakota. Also, like, for the, the, the realism and her showing 
empathy and sympathy towards him and and that but the the yeah the sex montage did not need to have gratuitous nudity did not need and and we did not need the the part where he gets in bed with what was it Susie and um yeah you know the yeah the two of them and yeah so so the movie is critical of capitalism but it does not bring up an alternative ultimately it doesn't really have to not every movie that's critical of capitalism has to present an alternative and certainly the the movie does a really good job of explaining the problems you know because we spend a lot of time seeing people live in in bad neighborhoods you know and jesus is you know might or yeah jesus is going to get out because of how good he is at basketball and then you have all these people who know him and they're like you know you know lala points out when you go off to college you're gonna leave me behind and let's see yeah so we get yeah the the flashbacks are are quite good and i appreciate that you know jake is shown to be pushy but he is giving good advice like he does actually believe in in jesus uh, both of them but the no the the you know it's it's not an you know it's not like ike turner who was just jealous and thus got abusive now let's see so so yeah we see the yeah um martha why did i say that name anyway died as she lived trying to you know defend jesus and but but yeah the the i've seen others criticize that flashback it was a little silly it was too convenient like it's this thing of like on one hand you know it it has to be like you you need a serious rift between them and you know him blaming jesus blaming jake for the mother's death is obviously a huge rift but he also like spike lee writing and directing the scene was worried that people were going to lose all empathy for jake you know i mean it's like domestic abuse is not some small thing you know countless people suffer greatly under it so yeah it is this thing like he basically he shoves her and she happens to land in a way that you know yeah it's it's i i wish that lee had picked either we're gonna you know like this guy or we we aren't and some kind of it, it was a little too yeah and yeah uh i i really appreciate you know jake points out that you know the media had to call i forget his last name but there was some other amazing ball player that was also named jesus and the media had to you know the yeah the media called him black jesus instead of just jesus when you know it's such a ridiculous thing like Jesus was not white. Like I'm I'm willing to grant that there was probably some person you know alive 2000 years ago who you know yeah, who who had the name Jesus and lived in what was it Nazareth or whatever. But the idea that you know yeah, I don't believe in any kind of, of God or religion. And if you are going to worship anything, I, I, I think we should worship nature instead. Because that is what's actually keeping us alive. And that's why the, you know, the planet is dying. Because we haven't been taking care of nature. But the... Um, yeah. And also, there's no way he was white. Look at... like. He might have been black, 
otherwise he he looked like Middle Eastern. There's no way that he was white. Let's see. And yeah, and and uh, what was it? Um, yeah, they bring up the story of Delilah, which is also just such a disgusting misogynist story. And yeah, Jake attacks, you know, Lala's brother, obviously not actually brother. And he also, um, he also gets kind of physical with the, the nephew and, you know, you can tell he's not, he, he wishes he, he's had better self-control of this kind of thing. And let's see. Yeah, um, you know, they, they bring up this idea of, you know, some, some men resort to homosexuality in prison because there are no women. And, you know, the parole officers talk about, oh, you know, that's technically not being gay kind of thing, as if there's something wrong with being gay. Although I know, unfortunately, there are many young men who think that there is. But but yeah, um, let's see. Yes, and and after the the sex with Dakota, he goes and you know kisses and hugs the the tombstone of Martha. And yeah, uh, like others, the, the Lala's abortion is just not treated with enough seriousness in, in uh, like not not that they make like a joke out of it but it's not given enough time you know and and it's again this misogynist idea of like women trick men into impregnating them so that they'll have like a hold on them like the scene does you know i i empathized with her in the when, when she's talking about being left behind by him. But, but yeah, you know, if you're gonna, like, I'm, I'm pro-choice. I'm not a, I, I don't think there's something wrong with abortion as long as it's, you know, let's see, I can always, I, I sometimes mix this up. Late-term abortions, that's getting to, you know, what, what is it, if, if the, if the fetus is viable outside the mother's womb, then you you shouldn't have an abortion, you know. And I don't know why. Well, I know why because there's a lot of people who lie about it. Unfortunately, some and a lot of Americans do believe that late term abortions happen, which like almost like statistically, it's it's almost nothing. Like most abortions are before the that you know what was what it the before before the third trimester, I think it's called. But when you bring it up in fiction, you really should acknowledge the kind of thing it does. You know, she just says, I, I agreed to have the abortion. And then, you know, there's this brief, you know, brief flashback. And, you know, and, and I do appreciate that. Although, I mean, I don't even know if, like, some people leave this movie saying, oh, Jesus, I guess he is just a saint. He does some pretty fucked up things. I, maybe we watched a different movie but he does some pretty fucked up things. He cheats on Lala, and pushing someone to have an abortion is, like, especially if it's just, you know, he's like, ah, oh, you know, the colleges aren't going to want me if I have a kid, so have an abortion. Like, just, yeah. Um, I, um... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and quote. Uh, I just watched the, the Hunter because I will be doing a video on Bullet at some point. I haven't planned exactly when. Uh, and, you know, Steve McQueen is the lead in both. And I don't have that many movies with Steve McQueen to watch for research for. But, um, yeah, there's a, there's a really great line in that when, uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to... I'm not going to get into which characters, but there's a couple in that movie, and uh, they discuss an abortion, and the the you know the woman says even if we agree, we're not both 
getting, we're not both getting an abortion. We're not both getting up on that table. So, yeah. Um, it is sadly a decision that is sometimes made like that, but don't make it like something that gets so little time. You know, it, it just, it feels, yeah. You know, honestly, the, the, you know, I, I, yeah. So I'm not trying to talk anyone out of having an abortion, but, you know, a, a number of women do feel very bad about it afterwards and sometimes for a long time afterwards. You know, some of the most aggressive, you know, anti-choice activists are women who had abortions. And it's like, you made a choice that you regret. That doesn't mean any that other people shouldn't be allowed to have the choice. You know, but yeah, the the um, yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't have it be such a small part of of the movie. And it's like Lala is basically barely in the movie after that is said. So we really don't see what it did to her. Now, um yeah, so you know, good game between Jake and Jesus, and I really appreciate, like, so many of these movies, it's like, the big game, you know, and it's like, it's gonna determine, if, you know, no, it's a, it's a more, it's a more emotional climax, because it's personal, kind of, I'll, I'll grant some of these movies, it is a very emotional climax, but it's not always so personal, and here it's very personal, and yeah, just, I, I quite appreciate that. And, yeah, it kind of annoyed me. Like, so when Jesus is claiming that he did not have sex with women, which, you know, he didn't at, at the college, which we know he did, he brings up, you know, he says, oh, my, my mother would be turning in her grave if she thought, if she, yeah, if, if I had sex with a white woman. And then Lala is like, so she must be spinning in her grave, I guess. And then Jesus is like, I don't think you should talk about my mother like that. And it's like, you literally just brought up your mother in order to try to convince her, con convince your, your girlfriend that you didn't cheat on her. She's just continuing that, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know if the movie is realizing how messed up he's being. You know, it, it, of course she's going to ask about that. Of course she's going to suspect that kind of thing. That's, yeah. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, uh, at the end of the day, um, he does, you know, he does go to Big State, but he didn't sign the paper. So, you know, maybe it won't get Jake any time off. And we see Dakota leaving on the bus because, you know, the, he, he asked the, the parole officers for money, claiming that he was going to spend a lot of money on her taking her out. But no, he gave her money so she could leave. She could get out of that life. And, yeah, you know, it's, again, it's, it's such a small part of the movie. But I do appreciate at least this, this notion. And it is, of course, also, like, um... Yeah, I, I suppose it's, yeah, yeah, at the end of the day, like, it's a, it's a very stereotypical depiction of sex work. Like, you know, there are a lot of sex workers who are very happy with the, you know, that, yeah, they weren't, they didn't feel like they had no other choice. They, they chose it, they, and, and they're happy with that choice kind of thing, you know, so... But but in the 90s, I'm not sure there were very many nuanced depictions of sex work, so. And at least it does, like, it's not a, you know, they, they, they didn't end it with her being beaten to death by sweetness, I think they call him. You know, she gets to leave and she leaves. She doesn't stick around out of some miss... You know, she she does apparently think that he loves her and she does apparently feel something for, for sweetness, but... It, you know, she does ultimately also leave, which is also, I'm not sure I feel like the movie did quite enough to make me 
believe it, maybe there's like a deleted scene of her making the decision anyway um yeah so they're at the end like you're like holy crap is he really gonna be shot by by the sniper but the sniper holds fire and he does and you know jake does end up going back over the line to, to, you know and yeah it's it's kind of a the the metaphorical the the endings metaphor you know is is kind of nice you know the he he still supports jesus even though he can't be near him you know he doesn't hate jesus for not signing kind of thing and that brings us to the final section which i am just going to there we go. So, notes taken before watching. Now, let's see. Um, right, so, yeah, critic quotes. Bill Simmons' review for ESPN pointed out factual flaws in the story. Coaches aren't allowed to discuss potential recruits until after the signing period. Come on, Spike. And while we're at it, players aren't allowed to visit a college one week before the signing deadline. Jesus couldn't live alone with his sister without both of them being thrown in a foster home. And there's no way in hell that Jesus wouldn't have just turned pro if he was that good and that broke. Meanwhile, Jake is struggling with living in the dregs of the city. Let's see. It, yeah. Um, living in the local brothel where he meets uh, sex worker Dakota Burns, who's chronically beaten by her pimp, with Jake eventually developing feelings for her that, as one of the few faults of the film, don't really progress to anything beyond a raunchy sex scene between the two, leaving us wondering if Jake actually liked her or just needed to get off. Let's see. Um... Let's see. Um, while Jesus ultimately tramps in the game, blowing out his aging father, he decides to go big state regardless. However, as he didn't sign the contract, the warden and governor don't think that Jake actually accomplished the goal, releasing a story that Jake had actually escaped that's now facing even more time tacked onto his remaining 15 year sentence. The subtle blend of politics never takes the forefront, positioned subcutaneously providing each scene with a dual layer between that of a young man with a troubled past attempting to remain righteous against a tide of other self-interest and the system that makes such a struggle so significant. While there doesn't seem to be a racial component be behind Jake's conviction at first sight, one could argue that his commitment to Jesus' success was in order to get him out of the streets. Very true. At the center is a disgraced man, Jake, who is in the slammer for manslaughter of his wife, although for most of the characters... The difference between manslaughter and murder is a minor quibble. And... Yeah. The... the You know, I, I quite appreciated that. Because at the end of the day, you know... It's, it's essentially the same result. Like, I, I do think that the scene itself that showed it should have, like... I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not excusing uh, domestic abuse, but at the end of the day, I I think it should either have been something else or he needed to push it at least a little further because essentially it seemed like he just, like, pushed her, like, shoved her. He didn't think that what he was doing would seriously hurt her, and I just think that it there needed to be some, like... Yeah, um... I mean, I appreciate that it's not more contrived than it was. It's it's a little contrived, but not as, as much as, uh, yeah. So, that is the end of the video. So, let me know what is your favorite Spike Lee movie, or joint, I should say. And the, you know, um, yeah, so I've, you know, this movie and Green Street Hooligans are movies that make me really care about the sport even though i you know while watching the movie even though i don't uh, you know in real life do you have any other movies that you know you as someone who doesn't care about sports cared about you know yeah hit me up in the comments let me know if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell but not hard enough that it you know 
thunks its head into something and dies of it. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And recently the, these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog. So we'll catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.